Welcome to Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond. Today I am talking with Titus Bartolotta, who is the founder, president, and lead consultant for Collaborative Solutions Group, where he and his team work with leaders to bring transformational and measurable growth to their teams and companies. Check out the episode here, Titus discussed the importance of single-mindedness, how being focused and present help drive outcomes, and why the present truly is a gift. I hope you enjoy. Titus, thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You know, when we chatted a little while ago, I shared, we had met years ago when we were both doing completely different things. And I just remember from the, the limited interaction we had, two things. One, this guy is really good at his job. And the second one, it, part of that really was your communication, just so thorough with your communication, following up the questions that you asked, make sure that we accomplish what we are trying to do for our project. So with that, as I mentioned, really excited to have you here today. And if you can, to kick us off, just tell the listeners a little bit you know, about yourself, your background, and really what you're working on today. Yeah. Well, I can't do, I can't uh, answer that without first uh, saying thank you so much, man. Those are super kind words. I'm so grateful that you would uh, pause your day to even want me to be on the show. That that uh, you would you would say something friendly and nice to get us started, um, and and kind of get me all warm and fuzzy over here. So thank you for that, Scott. You are always the man, and I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. So my name is Titus Bartolotta, and you know I started my own personal development and professional growth firm called Collaborative Solutions Group. Uh, officially about six years ago and uh, completed a certification through the John Maxwell program um, and started to really lean into the the gifts and skills and experience that I believed that my life and my God poured into me relative to coaching, training, mentoring. And so today I get the great privilege to not only be an entrepreneur and a business owner, uh, but I get to work with entrepreneurs and business owners, leaders, People that, um, you know, I like to call folks that are movers and shakers, man. People that are hiring and firing, building communities, um, and really transforming a community through the backbone of business uh, and finding a way to make commerce do more than just uh, create profit, but create careers and grow and develop people. And so to be able to sit down with entrepreneurs and leaders and help them hone their leadership skills and their salesmanship and, and their effective communication and time management and, and so on and so forth is so rewarding. Uh, it's so rewarding. I, 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 I'm so humbled when someone hires me to come speak at an event or to teach a workshop or to private coach them. I just go, my goodness, um, what I've come to know about most humans is they are resourceful. They are articulate. They are smart. They are caring. They are good people. They are good creatures by God. And so for them to have enough humility to say, I think I ought to get some help. I think I ought to just not go it alone and have someone come alongside of me to fight one's own pride and arrogance to say, what do you think I ought to do uh, is never lost on me in my job and something I look forward to putting pants on every day to go do. That is it's so cool just to hear somebody so passionate about what they do and just waking up every day full of gratitude to go out and, and help others, whether it's just personal development, helping them develop their business. It's just so great to do. And it's, it's always so fun. And I, I can speak from my experience as well, just waking up, knowing yeah. that what you're doing is making a difference, helping people's personal lives, helping their professional lives, which oftentimes are you know, very closely connected, right. uh, but really yes. just helping people get to that next level is just so, so cool to hear. Yeah. I mean, with your role with the, the collaborative solutions group and the coaching that you do and working, you know, especially with a lot of small business owners, entrepreneurs, organizations, you know, I'm sure you come into contact with a lot of folks that are great communicators or that they're on the cusp and you know, maybe they, they just need help, you know, building whatever skill sets they may be lacking. But when you hear that term, great communicator, or somebody has strong communication skills, what comes to mind for you? Man, you know, it's one of those things where, um, well, let me word it this way. Um, if you've had a great meal, um, 
generally you'll go, oh man, I could really taste the rosemary or the garlic in this. You know, it, it, it jumps out. There's an ingredient or two that really splits the atoms between all the things in the soup. And you go, I know somebody used leeks or onions or what have you in this dish. I don't know all the ingredients, but I know it's got at least this in it. And I would say for me, communication, effective communication is really, um, it, it's, it's, it's a dish, it's a meal with lots of ingredients. And I want to respect and honor all of them. And, and so I'll say a few that I think are, are most relevant in the great communicators I know. Now you can look at great presidents, great CEOs, entrepreneurs, um, folks that just had a, a huge impact on the human experience. And really, it'll always be because of strong leadership skills and effective communication skills. It's always, mm -hmm. they had those two things. Those are the defining things. But I would say folks that, um, people that are active listeners, right? Like when you are paying attention and you are dialed in and you're leaning in, um, it, it matters. It means a lot. It, it does a lot for you mentally. It does a lot for you. Um, and, and the person that you're speaking to, it actually encourages them to give you more information. It makes the person feel like it, this is worth pouring my heart into this guy or this gal. And so you as a communication expert, you actually are gathering more data so that you're better prepared to speak. Um, I think great communication experts, people that are just crushing it, are very clear in their message. And there's not a lot of room for you to guess what they mean. You know, I've had folks tell me in the past um, that I might be a bit repetitious, but I have noticed that repetitious uh, is, is a trait that is found in most great speakers. And really what it is, is clarity. I'm going to make sure that everyone in this room walks away knowing what the heck I meant. Now, I may have to reword it or, or use a second or third analogy, but the person in the back of the room who looks a bit confused halfway into my, my, uh, my monologue they also deserve to walk out of this room fully knowing what the heck we were talking about. And if that means some of you have to hear it a second or a third time or a second example, and you already understood it the first time, if that means you guys have to be just a little more patient so that we all walk out together, I don't know a better definition of effective communication than to not just cross the finish line, but to bring everyone with me to the finish line. And so I would say being super clear being repetitious, being an active listener uh, are, some of, are, are some of the garlic, onion powder, <laughs> rosemary. So those are some of the ingredients that jump out of the bowl and right onto your tongue, in my opinion. Obviously, there's a lot of other ingredients. Those are some of my favorites. I love the, the food analogy, right? That these are all these yeah. different ingredients. And when yeah. somebody has the right mix, they, they jump out, you taste it, you just, like you said, you know, that's the rosemary, it's the garlic, whatever it yeah. may be. And like I said, you're killing me because we're coming up on lunchtime. I haven't, <laughs> haven't ate yet. Uh, so if we hear my stomach going, it's because of the analogies that you're using. And you know, a lot <laughs> of key things that you mentioned there with around you know, the active listening, being clear, being repetitive. And you know, for me, this active listening, it comes up a lot. And I've noticed it a lot with my kids. And, and I've talked about a number of things that I do when I'm you know, talking both at work or with my family. But something I've been noticing a lot, especially with my, my youngest, is if she wants to show me something. A lot of times it might be just like a video on her phone or, or something, that's something that she did at school. She's checking in on me. Like she's like, if I'm mm. like over her, her shoulder, like looking on the iPad, saying, hey, dad, check this out. And if I'm watching, she's checking back to make sure that I'm still locked in to her and I'm yeah. not checking my phone. I'm not daydreaming. So this idea of being locked in when you're in a conversation with somebody is so powerful, not only yeah. because as you mentioned, the, the great information and intelligence that you're getting to help move forward with whatever the conversation or initiative may be, but also what it's signaling. This idea yeah. that you are important to me, that you, mm -hmm. right now you are my main focus which I think helps build up your credibility, which helps build up your trust, brings down barriers on the other side. So people will continue to open up and you can just make that dialogue and that relationship that much stronger. So no, I think spot on with the, the various ingredients that jump out, yeah. there's so many of them. Some sure. people excel. And just like with a, a lot of things, when something becomes too strong, it can become a weakness. So somebody may over index in one thing and it can somewhat be sure. detrimental, just like if you're a chef and like me, you go all in on the garlic 
Uh, it can it. sometimes overpower the dish, but no, I think that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And you, if you think of today's business environment, or especially maybe with small businesses, entrepreneurs, what are you seeing as maybe one or two you know, key skills that are just really important for folks to have today when it comes to communication skills? Yeah, I would say the two, you know, and communication is one of these things where it bleeds into so many other soft skills. I mean, you know, people that are great at time management are likely really just great at communication and time management is a byproduct of their communication ability, meaning I understood I needed to manage my time and time block things. So I communicated effectively through a Google calendar or what have you. Mm -hmm. And because of my communication, my written skills, I was able to perform. But I would say that, that when you're asking the specific question in communication, some of the skills that, that uh, really seem to, to jump off to me are, are two things. Um, one is to just be, and you kind of touched on it a moment ago, but to be present, to just be, kind of be in the moment. Right. I've noticed so many times that um, whether I'm speaking or someone is speaking to me, a moment ago, we were just talking about the importance of active listening, meaning when others are speaking, I'm present, I'm here. But even when I'm talking, I mean, there are times where speakers and communicators uh, drift in the middle of their own conversation. I mean, they're actually the ones speaking and they've, they've mailed it in, so to speak, right? I mean, I've already said this a thousand times. I don't, I don't need to be sharp right now. I don't need to hit the tone or hit the pauses. I don't need to, I don't need to lean into the emotional connection and engagement in my conversation because they've heard it. I've said it. Uh, this is not that big of a deal. And so people leave being in, in the moment. I'm convinced, Scott, that uh, there's a reason, you know, you've got the future and you've got the past. Uh, I'm convinced that the reason we call this moment the present is because if you can find a way to be in the present, it's a gift. Right? It is a gift. And I think that's why we call it that. I think it is not easy. It shouldn't be uh, ignored. Being present in the moment in which that you're delivering or that you're receiving information has got to be one of the top ones. And, and if I could give you a second one, I would say it's this. Um, I don't think that I can think of too many things in life where somebody talked about 10 different things they wanted to accomplish um, and, and through the art of multitasking, talking about all 10 things, they were able to accomplish it. You know, we see this in politics often when they try to put too many things into a bill and then it doesn't mm -hmm. pass. I think this is true in communication. What's really moved the needle in human experience is, is not one's ability to multitask. Even that, even, even in our communication and our speech, we can multitask. We can talk about too many topics at one time. Mm -hmm. We could try to build false bridges between them so it looks like they're all connected. But some of them are a stretch and you shouldn't have even brought it up. <laughs> what I do know to be true, Scott, is that the most dynamic communicators that actually saw the end in mind, meaning the result and the outcome from them talking was fruitful, wasn't because they were scattered and you know, multitasking in their communication, but they were single-minded was I'm going to put my head down. This is all I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be clear in my message and I'm not going to try to build a bridge or stretch to some other secondary thing. I am staying focused on my primary single-minded point of conversation. And when I'm done, uh, we will have moved the needle and there will be an outcome that was worth that investment. I think those are the two skills that communicators uh, when they crush those, they win the room and they win the minds and hearts of those they talk to. And, and I would say that there's probably a very strong connection between being present and that idea of single mindedness, right? Because when you yeah. have so many things you're trying to accomplish, that's when you can drift. That's where you're going to forget about something. You're going to lose the audience because they're thinking, wait, yeah. wait, wait, we were just talking about this. Now we're talking about this. What, what happened yes. to the other thing? So this, this idea yes. of single mindedness, and, and we see this a lot in email communication is mm. that you get so much as dumped into an email and everyone's like, okay, I'm just writing it down. I'm going to put it all out here. They're going to get it. And then what happens? You read a few lines of it. You, you see no point to what's going on. You see no end in sight. You're scrolling through it and you yeah. just give up on reading. So I think yeah. this idea of being really focused and intentional with the communication is important and in being present, that is so powerful. And once again, similar to the active listening, it goes back to also what message are you sending? 
Mm -hmm. you know, I've had this before you know, early on in my career when I was a sales leader, where you know, we would do team big team meetings in person, get get people together. You know, our boss would fly in, you know, a territory director, a regional VP would fly in. You know, the reps are presenting, I'm presenting, doing things, and the the leaders in the back on their computer the entire time. Mm -hmm. So they weren't necessarily directly communicating. They weren't in front of the room communicating, but they were definitely communicating a message to that team, yeah, to that group around their importance, their value. Where, where do they stack up to the point where I've had to talk to some of them and say, you know, listen, when you're in town, I, I understand you probably have a lot going on, but during these times, I would really love it if you could be active and engaged with the team, just because they value your input, they value your perspective, and they really want to be able to learn from you while you're here. So I agree, those two things, the idea, be present, be singularly focused will really help drive the communication forward. And I think, as you mentioned, win the hearts and minds of the audience. So that is, that yeah. is great. Yeah. So Titus, as you think about your career journey, you know, because I know you know, prior to the, the collaborative solutions group, you know, a very successful sales career uh, and just a number of things beyond that. If you could point to say one skill that you've had around communications that has helped you to get to the point where you are today, what would you say that that one key skill has been? I would say that um, passion, right? I, I think that I I can't think of too many things that I speak about that I lack passion in. Uh, I've just made a commitment to not talk about it unless I'm going to speak passionately about it. So I'm often very passionate about everything. Now, there was a time in my life that I was told to talk about things, right? In sales, I would like for you to sell these products, these services. And so the, the subject matter in which I speak on might be uh, something that others ask me to talk about. And this is not really too far removed from today in my career, although the menu, so to speak, of what you can get me to talk about, I have now selected, right? Versus, mm -hmm. versus my boss. But now the subject matters that I speak on are a menu, a list of things I want to talk about. You can pick whichever one you want. But I am totally sold out to the subject matter, to the product, to the service, to the people, to the agenda, to the vision. I, I'm just not going to speak and, I'm, and, and not have passion. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a false passion. I don't want them to think I'm passionate. Right. I literally spend time before any opportunity to speak and I get passionate about the subject matter. It's part of, it's part of my ritual. It's part of my practice. It's part of my go to life plan that if I'm going to talk about this thing, I want to be passionate about it more even so than I want to know about it. Yeah. And that may sound foolish, but, but if I could add some clarity, I think we ought to know that which we talk about, but, but I would rather know 10% of the subject matter uh, and be a hundred percent passionate about it. Like when I watch people know a hundred percent about something, but they, they have 10% passion. I don't even care to hear them talk about it. So right. like none of us get to know all of your beautiful knowledge and wisdom because I can't get past the first four minutes because you seem miserable mm -hmm. talking about the thing. And so if I'm going to talk, even in a conversation where you think, well, Titus, how could you prep? How could you prepare and and build your passion before you speak when you're in the midst of a conversation with someone. Well, what I've chosen to do is when I engage in a conversation, I get passionate about the person and I remind myself how much they matter. And I remind myself how much what they have to say to me is important. I remind myself about how, how this is their chance to be heard and that all humans are really only trying to be heard, understood and loved. And I get a chance to check all three of those boxes for another human being. All I have right. to do is deeply care. I just have to love them. That doesn't cost me anything. I just have to hear them and let them be heard. It doesn't cost me anything. But, but if I do those two, then I get to understand them. And I'm telling you, if you want to build a connection with another human being, have that person walk away from you feeling understood, it's a game changer. And if you lack passion, that person will not feel understood. And I just won't waste the minutes God's given me or, or the words um, that I respect so deeply because I'm in love with words. I just won't devalue them by, uh, by not wrapping them in passion because they deserve it. And so do the people I speak to. 
it, you can you can definitely tell when you talk with somebody that has that true passion for what they do versus you say kind of the false passion. They're putting it on because they feel mm. that they need to 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 get a sale, whatever it may be. Sure. Yeah, but as as I think about you, know, a lot of folks out there may not be you know, as fortunate as say you or I to be in a role where you're just truly passionate about what yeah. we do, who we serve, the the solutions that we have. But yeah. you know, I would say if you think about what you're doing, there's probably somewhere along that that line of interactions where there's something you're passionate about. You may be selling widgets or whatever it may be. Um, but if you think about the person that you're selling to, you know, what are you doing to help them in their career? What does your widget go into that may be part of a medical equipment that helps to save lives? So if you really Ooh. step back and think about what you're doing, I think people can start to find passion around what they do. Once again, it may not be directly in their product. Yeah. It may simply be in helping someone else be successful in their role because their solution is going to help them be successful in their career or to help develop other people and their, and yeah. their output. So I think yeah. really kind of stepping back, if you feel like, oh, I can, there's, I'm not excited about what I do. I'm a data scientist. Maybe I crunch numbers all day. Okay. On the back end, what are those numbers feeding into? What is that helping your organization? Where's this information going? So I think taking kind of more of a bigger, broader look at the kind of the whole ecosystem uh, that you're in can help some people find that passion until they can get to that true part where that, yes, this is something that I, everything about it, I'm just 100% bought into. Well, and let me, and if I could, Scott, you know, let me say this, you know, I deal with a lot of folks that say, Titus, I hate my job, man. I just, I hate, I don't find joy in it. I'm not passionate about it. It's not my purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not what I was called to do. And so then I ask them, you know, as motivational and as positive and optimistic as I am, and that is really my DNA. I'm also very pragmatic and very direct, right? And people pay me to like provide them with critical thinking and solutions mm -hmm. and direction, not just uh, pie in the sky. I think I can, I think I can, even though there's value in that stuff. Right. And so I say this to people when they go, gosh, I'm just not passionate. I'm not in my purpose. I, I ask questions like, does this, does what you're doing, the, the thing that you're communicating about, the task that you have, the job you work in, <clears throat> Does this currently pay your bills? In, in many cases, they say, well, yes, of course. Does it provide for your family? Well, yes, of course. I go, great. It is possible for your, your livelihood to coexist with your purpose in life. You know, you might find ways inside the job to tap into the passion, like mm -hmm. kind of what you just said, Scott, yep. or perhaps you find ways to be passionate outside of that through charity or giving or church or whatever, whatever moves the needle in your heart. And that passion, that fuel source, that's all passion is. It's gasoline. Mm -hmm. You can use that in the tank with the thing that you may be lacking passion in. What you got to do is just get your balloon filled up, right? And if the thing you're doing deflates your balloon, it, you got to start with a full balloon. You can't have a half already deflated, <laughs> deflated balloon when you go into the thing that doesn't instantly organically bring you passion you will find that that energy will get you through the moment and eventually you'll start realizing I can be passionate about this thing, right? If I'm not breaking laws and being, you know, uh, dishonest and lacking morals yeah. and ethics, if I'm not doing that, I probably can find passion in all the things yeah. because when I was six years old, I used to be passionate about everything. When I was in kindergarten, I used to be passionate about everything. It is possible to be passionate about the thing that you're currently not passionate about. Wow. If you would just flex and stretch the passion muscles and before you'd realize it, you go, my goodness, look at your small kids if you have them and go, how does my kindergartner have so much passion about everything? And why would Jesus say, let the young kids, let, let them come. They got something to say. So it's just a muscle. It's a skill set, Scott. All you got to do is work on your, your passion skill set and then you can apply it in areas where right now you don't feel like you have passion instead of running away from oh, this isn't my thing, go do something else. You, we all know those people, Scott. Like mm -hmm. They've got 10 half-baked ideas. They yeah. just keep bouncing like a ping pong ball, seeking joy and happiness, when in reality, they can pour passion into what they're doing today, right now. And I think closely tied to that concept is this idea of gratitude. Mm. You, you hit on it, right? Does, does what I'm doing today, is it paying my bills? Is it putting the roof over my head? Is it providing food for me and my family? 
shifting that mindset to focus on less on maybe what's wrong, what I don't enjoy, what are the good things, what are the positive things? And as you mentioned, kind of searching beyond whether it's finding something in that, that chain at work where I can be passionate about or bringing something in from the outside, whether it is through yes. charitable work, volunteering, hobbies, to really find that passion to get you fired up, to carry over into work, or eventually you'll start to see them at some point, that sweet spot comes together. No, yeah. love it. And yeah. I can see just as you were talking about your passion coming through, just getting, getting very animated in your voice. I, it's, it's so cool to hear. You, Titus, as you think throughout your career, who's someone that has influenced your communication style? Maybe what's something that you've taken from someone else and, and incorporated, made your own, kind of put your own little twist on it, but it's kind of become part of your communication <clears throat> DNA now, so to speak. Man, that's a great question, Scott. I would say, um, you know, I would say John Maxwell mm -hmm. is, is a brilliant communicator. And when I decided to get certified, you know, most of the folks in our field in coaching, training, and speaking, they don't really go train or, or they just, they assume I was successful in my job. And so I have some experience, therefore I can coach and train people. Mm -hmm. And most of them don't get certified or go through some formal training. And I didn't want to do that. I was very successful. And, and, and I had, I had gone through some life experiences that were very motivational and some professional experiences that were very recognizable of success, but I still wanted to go study. I, I wanted, um, if I wanted to be a great leader, I, I knew I had to be a great student. And so I went and studied under John Maxwell. There's a lot of people I could have picked. Um, I picked John and, and if, and if the listeners don't know, and John doesn't need my help to brand himself. He's a very wealthy, uh, he doesn't need Titus to give him a shout out, but, but over the last 30 to 40 years, this man has written over a hundred books and that's just stop right there. That's insanity. Right. That's mm -hmm. absolutely the, the most crazy thing. And it's factual. Um, but he has dominated leadership and personal growth and, and effective communication categories for, for nearly four decades. And so I have um, enjoyed his style. It's simplistic. It's direct. It's connective. It's engaging. Uh, he started off in church. And as a person of faith, I, I, I very um, connected to that. I, I love you know, many people will say that my speaking style is, is that of a preacher. There's a cadence there. There's a buildup similar to, to what you might hear from a, a, a church pat preacher that, that's fired up. And, um, and so John has those moments, but then always brings things back to, to the, the lesson, the stories. He's such a wonderful storyteller. Um, I, I like to teach in, in storytelling and, and I think through this interview already, you know, with the examples of food and, and what have you, that's really what all I've been doing is mm -hmm. trying to paint word art in people's minds. Um, and so John does that at such a high level, excellent storyteller. Um, you know, so I would say John Maxwell has been in my lifetime who I've gleaned from the most. And as cliche as it may sound, it's hard to read uh, the, the choice words uh, of, of Jesus you know, and not go, man, that was pretty smart. The way he worded that It's pretty mm -hmm. smart. When you read the red parts of the Bible, you go, what a smart way when they said, are you supposed to give money? Are you, you know, you give money to, uh, you know, God, he, they were trying to trip him up and he goes, well, you give unto Caesar, what is Caesar's and give unto God, what is God? Just the way that he would take words and, and he would cut all the fat off of them. It was not mm -hmm. too long winded. It was not too short. So John uh, and, and, and for me, Jesus just had such a direct, engaging, pithy storytelling style. And man, I just hope that someday somebody says, um, I remember everything that guy said because he told me in a story format and it was fun and informative. Uh, that's, that, those, that's been my um, influences. If that's the question, that's my answer. Those are some great influences to have. And storytelling is just so powerful. We, we, yeah. we hear about this a lot. We work with a lot of folks on that. We get a lot of requests about it because as you mentioned, when somebody hears a story and they can make a connection to something else, that's maybe not directly related to that topic is when, when it can kind of click. And I know yeah. you, know, a lot of the people at my organization and folks that follow me on social media are probably sick and tired of hearing about my kids. But for me, when I think of storytelling, a lot of the inspiration comes from them. You just, the interactions yeah. that I have 
with them on a day-to-day -day basis, I see so many parallels to things in the work world, whether it's around communication or active listening or practicing or defining what good looks like. All these things I can take from my, from my family and incorporate it. And I would challenge anyone out there that's looking to improve their storytelling skills is really to try and find an aspect of your life where you can draw that. It might be that you're a sports coach. It might be from, from your kids or your, your partner or spouse at home. It could be from any aspect of it, a hobby that you have. If you start really thinking about it, you're going to find these aha moments where you're like, you know what? I, there's a connection here between this and something at work. So no, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. Thank you, Titus. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm so convinced that, I mean, science is clear on this, right? I mean, there's chemicals that get released in our minds and there's a lot of stuff that goes behind why stories work. But when you go all the way back to, to cave drawings, Scott, it wasn't sentences. It was stories etched into a wall. People spend so much money on movie tickets because the story is good. Yeah. Uh, and in the same breath, if you're a bad storyteller, stop telling the story. Stop telling me about what the what fish you caught. Get good. Go get great. Don't don't practice on me, the audience. Go get great at your storytelling. Hire someone like Scott or their organization. Get great at it. And then go tell a great story and you'll find that people say this, this is how, you know, you're telling a good story when people say, and then what happened? But when no one's asking you that question, they are waiting with bated breath for you to get to the end of your story. Yep. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Fantastic. So Titus, as we wrap up here, what would be your know, one closing piece of advice that you have somebody maybe early on in their career that's thinking about their own communication skills, whether they're trying to advance, move into a new opportunity, go off on their own into entrepreneurship, kind of closing thought piece of advice you may have someone in that scenario. You know, I, um, it's, it, it's always so hard for me because there's like only two or 3 billion uh, ways I would want to close this out. So to narrow it down is not easy, but, um, but Robert, Fulgham wrote a book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It's a pretty awesome book. And so if I could, if I, if, um, if I could just read like two seconds of, of, yeah. of kind of this book, uh, here's what it says. For those of you that haven't read it, think about how, you know, Scott's question was, how do we close out this interview? Like, what's the advice that people need to go to life and go to market? And uh, so let me read this real quick. All I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, um, but there in the sand pile at Sunday school, these are the things I learned. So check this out. Scott, this is how I'm going to answer your question. Here, here's what he says. In kindergarten, we learned this. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. <laughs> Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say sorry. Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. That is a fact, okay? Yes. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some take a nap every afternoon. And when you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands and stick together. I'm convinced that's the best way to go to life and market. I mean, we learned it in kindergarten. I'm just convinced that life is not about what new things should I be doing? It's probably more about how can I apply more pressure to my disciplines and be more consistent with the things I already know. Um, the problem in life is easily found. Perhaps I drink. I'm an alcoholic. It's not hard to find out that that's the problem. The answer in life, people feel like they need to climb up to the top of a mountain and go on a 40-day fast. The answer to most problems are, are pretty easy, Scott. Like, stop drinking. Maybe I need to lose weight. Say no to cookies every now and again. The hardest part is applying the answer to the problem. It's application. Mm -hmm. We learned most of the things we ought to do in life and business. Uh, we probably need someone to be in our corner and on our side to help us stay the way. But the truth of the matter is, is we get stuck just not going the way. 
it's almost never that we don't know the way. So that's my advice. That is a great way to, to wrap this up. Love all those recommendations. I, I think I learned pretty much all those in kindergarten as well. And now it's time to go back, revisit and start applying. And as you see, those things start to take shape. Uh, I think that's where you're going to see the impact on your personal life, professional life, career outcomes is really not only identifying what you may need to do, but actually applying those things to help you get there. So Titus, yeah. thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate it. And I hope you have the great rest of your day. You as well. Thank you, Scott. A special thanks again to my guest, Titus Bartolotta. I took so much from this conversation, especially around passion, storytelling, and how to be more like my kindergarten self. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to subscribe to Communicast so that you can be notified of new episodes. Thanks and have a great day.